Okay, so this is part two of our lecture on diabetes. And uh, in part one, we ended with this slide, and I, we were talking about the complications of diabetes. And we said that uh, diabetics have a higher incidence of strokes and retinopathy, you know, blindness, atherosclerosis, nephropathy. These are the people that you'll see in the hospital that uh, are on dialysis because their kidneys are shot. Um, they can have diabetic neuropathy, and so we have to be real careful that a diabetic patient doesn't go and walk on the beach because if they step on something, uh, they won't feel it, and, and often uh, it'll get infected, and they, they may end up losing you know toes or a foot or a leg uh, because of that. Um, diabetics also have impaired immune function, and so they have problems with uh, healing and uh, infections. That's uh, because of the high sugar levels. The bacteria love to grow in the in the high sugar levels, and they'll also have sexual dysfunction. Now, one thing I didn't mention in the last lecture, and if you can emphasize this with your diabetic patients, is the better they keep their blood sugar controlled, the less complications they will have and the longer their life will be. And let me uh, emphasize this in a different way. So if you have a, uh, a diabetic patient, and if you can get them to see that if you check your blood sugar daily, if it's high, give yourself insulin, keep your blood sugar, you know, normal levels, you will live a longer life and you will have less of these complications. But if you allow your blood sugar to go sky high, it's going to damage these different organs and uh, it will shorten your life and you're going to have a lot more complications. So it's something that we really need to uh, emphasize with our diabetic patients. Okay, now on this slide, um, we're going to talk about blood sugar levels and how we check them. Um, now at our hospital, uh, the normal blood sugar level is usually 70 to 110. At other hospitals, it may be 80 to 120. So it, it changes according to uh, different hospitals, but we're going to use 70 to 110. So that's normal. Now to um, diagnose if someone's diabetic, they'll go to the doctor, they'll check their blood sugar, and if it's above 125 on two separate occasions, this is diagnostic for diabetes. So if we say that 70 to 110 is normal, and we say that anything above 125 is diabetes, uh, what does it mean when, when someone has a blood sugar between that 110 and 125 mark? And this we call pre-diabetes. This person, should probably start monitoring their eating habits, their their uh, exercise habits, uh, because you know they may end up becoming diabetic uh, later on in life. Now, if we want to check someone's blood sugar right now at this point in time, we check their capillary blood glucose level, and you guys know how to do that. We poke their, we clean their fingers, poke their finger, get a little drop of blood. Yeah, put it in the monitor and we get a uh, blood sugar reading. And in the hospital, when this reading is a little bit high, then we're going to give them insulin to bring their blood sugars back down. And so that's a uh, capillary blood glucose uh, monitoring. Now let's say we have a patient that we want to know how well they've been doing over the last, oh, two, three months. They use a test that's called HbA1c. And uh, the normal HbA1c is four to six percent. Anything greater than eight percent shows that this person has poor control of their blood sugar. They've allowed their blood sugars to become high. And what happens in the body is that glucose, when it, its levels are raised, it attaches to hemoglobin. And uh, you guys know that hemoglobin is the protein inside the red blood cells. It has all kinds of binding sites. And when there's glucose floating around the blood, it attaches to those binding sites and it doesn't let go or dissociate uh, for the life of that red blood cell. And so if someone allows their blood sugar to get you know, sky high, the glucose attaches to the hemoglobin and it's there for the, the life of that red blood cell. And I think red blood cells live um, up to about 120 days. And so the HbA1c test shows how well they've uh, controlled their blood sugar over the last three months. Um, Often what you're going to see is when the doctor uh, sees the diabetic patient, they'll say, hey, Joe, you know, how have you been doing with your uh, your blood sugars? And the patient says, oh, I've been doing great, doctor. And the doctor will say, OK, let's see. And so they'll they'll do an HbA1c test. And if it shows that it's greater than 8 percent, then a lot of times the doctor 
has to have a a heart-to-heart -heart talk with the patient and say, oh, Joe, you haven't been doing too well. Your, your HbA1c is, you know, like 10 or 12, and that shows that your blood sugar has been uh, getting too high there. And so we, we got to make sure that we check our blood sugar, uh, monitor your diet, monitor exercise, and, and so the doctor will, will have a, a talk with that patient. Now on this slide, these are the signs and symptoms that we're going to see uh, in diabetes and we talked about the pathophysiology and we talked about the polys. Uh, so just to refresh your memory, remember we said that in type 1 diabetes that they have a genetic predisposition, there's an environmental trigger and it, it initiates an autoimmune disorder and their beta cells become damaged and when the beta cells are damaged the, the patient no longer produces insulin and insulin is used to uh, transport sugar into the cells for energy and so the sugar levels will will build up and so that's what we call hyperglycemia and that's our our first uh, manifestation of diabetes and when they have high blood sugar levels it's going to cause fluid to be drawn into the blood vessels and when the fluid is drawn in and it goes through the kidneys they're going to pee out all this extra fluid and so they're going to have those polys polyuria polydipsia polyphasia and uh, those are what we call the cardinal signs of diabetes. Um, now, a type 1 diabetic will also have weight loss because they're not uh, breaking down sugar, and so they have to break down fats and proteins. And so a lot of times a type 1 diabetic will, will have weight loss. Um, we talked about the complications of diabetes. They, they will have visual changes. You know, their eyes will become damaged. They'll have an increased incidence of infections. Uh, they'll have delayed wound healing. Uh, they'll have weakness and fatigue, and uh, they can also have numbness and tingling in the feet. Now with this slide here, um, when I talk to you guys in class, I'll tell you a, a funny little story about this, but what I want you to know now is, is this relationship between food, insulin, and exercise. And what we want to do is we want to know how each of these affects their person's blood glucose level and we want you to teach this to your patients and so um, i want you guys to know this before we have we teach it to our patients so you guys know that when we eat food it causes the blood sugar level to go up when we take insulin it causes blood sugar levels to drop uh, when we exercise it also lowers uh, blood sugar levels okay now the relationship here is um, if we want to maintain a normal blood sugar level in a patient, and maybe that patient had a little bit extra food, then what we need to teach them is, okay, if you ate a little extra food, then you'll probably need to take either a little bit more insulin or exercise a little bit more to maintain a normal blood sugar level. And let's say the, um, the patient goes out and exercises, and uh, they need to know that when they exercise more, this is going to cause their blood glucose levels to uh, become lowered. And so they'll either need to decrease the amount of insulin in response to that or increase the amount of food or else their blood sugar level uh, will become hypoglycemic or low. And so this is uh, what I want you to know and what I want um, you to teach your patients. Now here's another slide that says the same exact thing. And we're, the, the next two slides, we're gonna um, just emphasize this again. So I want you to understand the relationship between food, insulin, and exercise, and how they control blood glucose levels. So the food is going to raise blood sugar levels, insulin is going to lower blood sugar levels, and exercise is also going to lower blood sugar levels. Okay, so let's uh, use this hypothetic uh, patient here. Uh, this is diabetic Diane, and let's say she has a normal blood sugar in the morning. You know, so let's say somewhere between 70 and 110. Okay, so she eats her breakfast. What's gonna to happen to her blood sugar? That's right, it's gonna go up. And so her blood sugar starts going up, and then she says, oh, that's right, the doctor told me I need to take insulin so I don't have hyperglycemia. So she gives herself an insulin injection. What's gonna to happen to her blood sugar level? That's right, it's gonna start going down. And then she realizes a little bit later, oh, the doctor said I need to exercise because it's going to help me. And so she goes out and exercises. What's going to happen to her blood sugar level in response to that exercise? That's right, it's going to go down. And then when she um, 
after she exercises or or during exercise, she may become kind of cool and clammy. And she says, oh, the doctor said if I get cool and clammy, oh, that's right, I need to eat some candy. And so she eats some food. What's going to happen to her blood sugar? That's right, it'll come back up. And another example for diabetic uh, Diane, let's say she has normal blood sugar in the morning and she forgets to take her insulin. What's going to happen to her blood sugar? That's right, it's going to go up. And uh, so it goes up a little bit. And let's say that uh, she says, oh, that's right, the doctor told me I'm supposed to exercise. So she goes out to exercise. How is this going to affect her blood sugar level? That's right, again, it's going to decrease. Okay, and then she says, oh, I forgot to take my insulin. So she gives herself an insulin injection. What's going to happen to her blood sugar? Right again, it's going to decrease. And then she becomes uh, cool and clammy, and she says, oh, that's right, I need to take some candy. So she eats some food, and what happens to her blood sugar? Right again, it goes up. So I want you to know this uh, relationship, and you need to know it for yourself, and then also teach it to your, your patients. Okay, now this next uh, slide here, these are the oral anti-diabetic agents. And uh, in pharmacology, you'll learn all these and you'll learn all the side effects and, and uh, the differences. Um, I don't need want you to know all the real specifics right now because you'll get that in pharmacology, but just know there's seven classes. Uh, these work usually by making the tissues more sensitive to the insulin that the person uh, produces themselves or it causes the, an increased uh, release of insulin. Now oral anti-diabetic agents only work for type 2 diabetics. They don't work for type 1 diabetics because they uh, have no beta cells and they produce no insulin. Uh, the most common side effect of oral anti-diabetic agents is hypoglycemia and so these should always be given with the meal or within 30 minutes of the meal and make sure that the the patient's going to get a meal within 30 minutes or, or don't give this to them because they will become hypoglycemic. And most of these agents are taken once or twice a day. Uh, a lot of times in the hospital, we give them in the morning, uh, usually about 8 a.m. You know, before their breakfast. Um, and uh, sometimes the patients may receive a combination of these medications. Okay, now this next slide here, this shows insulin. And... Um, we mentioned already that insulin is the hormone that uh, the body produces to uh, regulate their blood sugar levels, and uh, it allows the transport of insulin, I'm sorry, of glucose into the cell to be used by energy. Now, insulin is required by uh, type 1 diabetics and also advanced stages of type 2 diabetes. Uh, human insulin is produced by recombinant DNA technology. Uh, let me tell you just a little story here. When I started nursing, you know, back before uh, 1991, uh, when we were giving, taking care of patients and giving them insulin and stuff, in the hospital we had beef insulin and we had pork insulin. And a number of the patients that we had back then uh, would have beef insulin or pork insulin allergies, and you would see it right there on their chart. Uh, because it was real hard to come by insulin back in those days because they'd have to go to a slaughterhouse. No, yeah, they'd have to go to a slaughterhouse and, and um, procure the um, insulin, you know, from the, the animals. But after uh, 1991, they started using what we called recombinant DNA technology. And they would take the gene um, from a human cell, the part, the gene that makes insulin, they'd put it in E. coli and they let E. coli do what they like to do, which is reproduce. And then what they do is after a whole bunch of E. coli produce lots and lots of insulin, then they, they take all the E. coli, they, they lyse them, and they, they remove the insulin through a centrifuge. And then they have all kinds of human insulin uh, created by uh, E. coli or bacteria. And this is how they get most uh, insulin nowadays. And uh, just a reminder that insulin works to lower blood glucose levels by promoting the transport of glucose into the cell. Okay, so um, we're going to stop here and we're going to go on to uh, part three. Uh, so I will see you soon. Bye.